the cries of the Orthodox faithful inside the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre announce the resurrection of the Lord. In a few minutes it spreads throughout the Basilica, from the candles of the Greek Patriarch, from the side windows of the wayside shrine, the miracle of fire, gift from the risen Christ. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, located within the historic walls of Jerusalem's old city, remains a beacon of spiritual devotion and historical symbol. But between its sacred halls, an astonishing event recently unfolded. The eyes of the crucifix, which had remained closed for centuries, suddenly opened. This remarkable occurrence raises interesting questions. What prompted this seemingly miraculous event after so many years? And what deeper significance does it hold for believers and scholars alike? Join us as we delve into the recent miracle in Jerusalem and explore its significance to believers globally. The Sacred Church of Jerusalem. The Church of the Holy Sealer, also known as the Church of the Resurrection, stands proudly in the Christian quarter of Jerusalem's old city, its origins tracing back to the fourth century. This ancient place holds immense importance for Christians worldwide, revered as the ultimate journey destination. According to belief, it marks the very spot where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and then miraculously resurrected. For centuries, Christians from all corners of the globe have journeyed to this sacred site, drawn by its deep spiritual significance. Remarkably, control over the church has been maintained through a complex arrangement involving various Christian groups and worldly entities. This complicated system has been in place for over 160 years, with some arrangements dating back even further into history. The primary groups responsible for overseeing different sections of the church include the Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Armenian Apostolic traditions. Additionally, there is involvement from the Coptic, Syriac, and Ethiopian Orthodox churches, albeit to a lesser extent. Each day, these groups conduct holy mass within the hallowed halls of this historic sanctuary, ensuring that its sacred purpose endures through the ages. The church in Jerusalem is not just any ordinary building. It's a magnificent structure that holds great historical and religious importance. It's a must visit for anyone interested in exploring the rich cultural and spiritual heritage of the city. The church is a place of worship and a hub for tourists seeking to engage themselves in its interesting history. During special occasions like Holy Saturday, the church comes alive with various ceremonies, such as the Holy Fire ritual led by the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, accompanied by the Coptic and Armenian Patriarchs. Hidden within the complicated iron latticework of the Coptic chapel lies a sacred altar cherished by the Coptic Orthodox community. In the past, the Georgians held the key to the edicule, a term that will be explained in more detail later. This edicule is a significant part of the church's architecture and history, holding secrets waiting to be uncovered. Recently, this revered sanctuary witnessed an extraordinary event believed by many to be a divine intervention, a celestial manifestation that deeply touched the hearts of pilgrims and believers. This divine sign served as a powerful reminder of the holiness and attraction of the church, echoing with people from all walks of life. Discovering the origins of the Church of the Holy Sealer is like uncovering a treasure collection of spiritual history. As they stand there, gazing at the statue of the Blessed Mother and the sight of the crucifixion, they can't help but feel the weight of its significance. This church was built to enshrine two sacred places, Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, and where the Blessed Mother stood, symbolizing the importance of both events in the Christian faith. Understanding the context and components of this church is like unlocking the secrets of a miraculous event that took place within its walls. The Crucifixion of Jesus. The Crucifixion of Jesus took place in Judea during the first century, most likely around AD 30 or AD 33. This significant event is detailed in the four churchly gospels of the New Testament and mentioned in epistles, supported by various ancient sources. While historians generally agree that the crucifixion occurred, 
there is some disagreement about certain details. According to the canonical Gospels, Jesus was arrested and put on trial by the Sanhedrin before being sentenced by Pontius Pilate. He was then whipped and crucified by the Romans. His death is described as a sacrificial act to atone for sins. Jesus was stripped of his clothing and given vinegar mixed with myrrh or gall to drink when he expressed thirst. After enduring these trials, he was crucified at Golgotha, positioned between two convicted thieves. According to the Gospel of Mark, he died around 3 o'clock p.m. This event is significant not only for its religious implications, but also for its historical and cultural impact. It continues to be a subject of study, discussion, and interpretation among scholars and believers alike. After Jesus died, a soldier, known in legends as Longinus, thrust his spear into Jesus' side to ensure his passing. This unexpected action resulted in a remarkable flow of both blood and water from the wound, a sign of the finality of Jesus' earthly life. Following this pivotal moment, Joseph of Arimathea, a secret follower of Jesus, took it upon himself to remove Jesus' lifeless body from the cross. With the assistance of Nicodemus, another clandestine disciple, they carefully placed Jesus' body in a tomb carved out of solid rock. This act of devotion, performed under the shadow of darkness, laid the foundation for the awe-inspiring events to come. In the ancient writings of 1 Corinthians 15.4, it is recounted that Jesus miraculously rose from the dead on the third day following his crucifixion. This extraordinary resurrection, shrouded in mystery and wonder, became the cornerstone of the Christian faith. After his resurrection, Jesus made numerous appearances to his bewildered disciples, demonstrating the power of his divine nature and the promise of eternal life. Dating back to the 4th century, the Christian tradition holds two sacred sites in profound reverence. Calvary, the rugged hill where Jesus bore the weight of humanity's sins and was crucified, and the tomb where he emerged victorious over death. These sites, once mere Jewish burial grounds, now stand as symbols of hope and redemption for believers around the world, drawing pilgrims from far and wide to experience the profound, spiritual significance imbued within their ancient stones. Later on, the place where Jesus was buried became a place where people worshipped other gods. But in 312, something remarkable happened. Constantine the Great, a powerful ruler, saw a vision of a cross in the sky and decided to follow Christianity. He even made a law called the Edict of Milan that said Christianity was okay. A bishop named Macarius from Jerusalem wanted to dig up the tomb where Jesus was buried. He asked Constantine for permission, and with the help of another bishop named Eusebius, they found three crosses near the tomb. People believed that one of these crosses had special healing powers and was the true cross where Jesus was crucified. This helped them find the place called Calvary, where Jesus was killed by the Romans. In 326 AD, Constantine ordered a church to be built at this special site. Over time, they cleaned up all the dirt and junk around the cave, and they found a rock-cut tomb where they believed Jesus had been buried. This church was built in the 4th century by Constantine. Sadly, many years later in 1009, it was destroyed by a ruler named Al-Hakim. The Mystery Beneath Jerusalem's Dome In the heart of Jerusalem stands the majestic Dome of the Rock, a place cherished by Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike. This sacred site, dating back to the late 7th century, holds deep significance as the oldest Islamic structure. Nestled beneath it lies a startling revelation. A mysterious entity has made its home there for millions of years. The Dome of the Rock occupies a special position under the Temple Mount, known as Al-Haram Al-Sharif in Islamic tradition evoking profound emotions among Muslims and Jews. For Muslims, it holds the belief that Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven from the rock beneath during the mirage, a significant religious event. Early writings from the 9th century began to link the site with this miraculous journey, but it wasn't until the 11th century 
that the Dome of the Rock truly captured widespread attention. Despite its ancient origins, much about the Dome's original purpose remains shrouded in mystery. Historical records lack detailed information about its construction, leaving scholars to speculate. The Dome's unique architectural style, departing from the typical mosque design, hints at a deliberate effort to blend Islamic aesthetics with the broader Abrahamic religious heritage. Thus, the Dome of the Rock stands not only as a physical marvel, but also as a symbol of the rich tapestry of faiths woven throughout Jerusalem's history. Perhaps the inspiration for this intricate structure was drawn from ancient Byzantine designs, like the nearby octagonal Caesar of the Mother of God, uncovered in 1992. It seems the architects aim to outshine prominent Christian landmarks in Jerusalem, such as the Dome Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Arabic inscriptions on the dome express a strict monotheistic belief, which contrasts with Christian teachings. Some speculate that Al-Malek, the ruler behind its construction, intended it as an alternative pilgrimage site to the Kaaba. But contemporary scholars cast doubt on this theory due to potential biases in historical accounts. Another interpretation suggests a deeper spiritual significance, linking the dome to Islamic and Byzantine beliefs surrounding Day of Judgment. This implies a higher purpose beyond mere physical presence. Beneath the surface of the Dome of the Rock lies a concealed chamber harboring mysteries that have puzzled humanity for centuries. Archaeologists have gradually unearthed artifacts that challenge our understanding of history including an ancient manuscript adorned with symbols surpassing linguistic barriers. The significance of these discoveries goes beyond their physical presence. They prompt a profound shift in our understanding of the past. As we unravel the secrets hidden beneath the dome of the rock, our perception of history becomes muddled, forcing us to reconsider narratives we once thought immutable, the Holy Sepulchre and Calvary. The church and runda were later rebuilt with changes made by Emperor Constantine IX, along with alterations by the Crusaders. These changes veered away from the original design. The rebuilt structure, enclosed within a shrine from the 19th century called the Edicule, now stands as a significant landmark. Within this church lies the tomb, which remains a central focus. Additionally, the church holds the last four stations of the Via Dolorosa representing the final moments of Jesus' suffering. Since its establishment in the 4th century, this site has drawn countless pilgrims, symbolizing Christ's resurrection. The church is also known as the Church of the Anastasis, meaning resurrection in Greek. This day marks an exciting occasion, as archaeologists uncover the contents of the Edicule. It's a rare opportunity to glimpse into the past, to see the original bedrock where Jesus is believed to have been laid after his crucifixion, according to the New Testament. Golgotha, also known as the Place of the Skull, is the site where Jesus was crucified. It's believed to have been located in an area of stone quarries outside the city walls. Around a decade after Jesus' crucifixion, a third wall was built around the area where he was crucified and buried, within the city limits of Jerusalem. This historical fact adds credibility to the idea that the Holy Sepulchre, a sacred site in present-day Jerusalem, is indeed where these events took place. The church that now stands there holds both the spot where Jesus was crucified, known as Calvary, and his burial site. This church, called the Martyrium, is a grand basilica. It was consecrated in 335 CE, and its original wooden doors from 326 CE remain showcasing its ancient grandeur. Visitors entering the church ascend a staircase to Calvary, the site of Jesus' crucifixion, which is adorned with lavish decorations. Another staircase leads down to an area called the Ambulatory. Calvary is divided into two chapels, one Greek Orthodox and the other Catholic. In the Greek Orthodox chapel, the altar is placed on the rock of Calvary itself, considered the twelfth station of the cross. Visitors can even touch this sacred rock through a special hole in the floor. Beneath the Golgotha Chapel on the ground floor lies the Chapel of Adam. According to legend, 
Jesus was crucified directly above the burial place of Adam's skull. These intricate details and legends add layers of significance to the Holy Sepulcher, making it a deeply meaningful site for Christians around the world. Some historical records suggest that when Jesus was crucified, his blood dripped down the cross and seeped into the rocks below, eventually filling up the skull-shaped cavity known as Adam's skull. This interesting tale dates back to the 11th century and is a popular belief among visitors to certain religious sites. One such place is a church where tourists can catch a glimpse of the rocky hill of Calvary, said to have a crack, believed to have been caused by an earthquake at the time of Jesus' death. However, there is debate among scholars about whether this crack was caused naturally or as a result of quarrying activities. In the church, there is also a statue of Mary positioned between the Catholic and Greek altars, symbolizing the 13th station of the cross, a significant moment in the crucifixion story. Near the church entrance lies the Stone of Anointing, also known as the Stone of Unction, where, according to tradition, Joseph of Arimathea prepared Jesus' body for burial. This tradition gained prominence during the time of the Crusades, and it was notably documented by an Italian Dominican pilgrim named Rico de Mon de Croce in 1288. The Renovation of the Sacred Site The stone that's there now was put in place during the rebuilding of 1810. The wall behind it stands out because it's covered in bright blue tiles with red banners showing the symbol of the Brotherhood of the Holy. There are lamps to light up the area, and a new mosaic on the wall tells the story of Jesus getting prepared for burial. On one side of the mosaic, Jesus is taken down from the cross, and on the other side, he's buried. At first, the wall was only meant to be temporary, but it had to be built stronger to support the arch above it after it was damaged in a fire in 1808. Now, it separates the entrance from the main church area and sits on top of four old graves from the time of the Crusades. Even though it's not needed for support anymore, people still debate whether it should be considered the 13th station of the cross, with some saying it represents Jesus being taken down from the cross. It sits between the 11th and 12th stations on the hill of Calvary. Furthermore, the lamps above the stone of the UN are not just ordinary lamps. They are adorned with chain links bearing crosses and have been generously donated by Armenians, Copts, Greeks, and Latins. Hanging above the stone is an intricate stand embellished with lamps, candles, and incense, creating a truly remarkable sight. The church also boasts a rotunda, a grand dome located on the far western side. At the center of the rotunda lies a small chapel known as the Edicule, a term derived from Latin meaning a small shrine. Inside the Edicule, there are two chambers. One chamber houses a revered relic called the Angel's Stone, believed to be a fragment of the stone that sealed Jesus' tomb. The other chamber is a smaller room containing the tomb of Jesus. To prevent pilgrims from taking fragments of the original rock as keepsakes, a layer of marble cladding was added to the tomb by 1555. Then, in October 2016, the top marble slab was removed, revealing an older, partly damaged marble slab beneath it. This older slab bore a striking crusader-style cross-carving. Beneath the slabs, the limestone burial bed remained untouched. Adjacent to the sepulchre on the northwestern edge of the rotunda lies the Chapel of the Apparition, a place exclusively designated for Roman Catholic worship. This adds another layer of spiritual significance to the church's rich history. On March 22, 2017, a special ceremony took place at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem to celebrate the completion of the conservation, restoration, and rehabilitation of the Edicule. The event was attended by important guests, including a delegation from Armenia, led by Foreign Minister Edward Nalbandian, and the Prime Minister of Greece, Alexis Cyprus. Many other dignitaries from different countries, leaders of Christian churches, and numerous pilgrims also joined the occasion. On that same morning, Edward Nalbandian visited the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem, and had a meeting with Patriarch Archbishop Norhan Manugian. 
Following their discussions, a procession led by Patriarch Manugian and Minister Nalbandian made its way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There, a solemn ceremony was held to commemorate the restoration of the Ediculi, the small shrine at Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. At Golgotha, the site of the Lord's crucifixion, there is an altar beneath which pilgrims can pay their respects to the exact spot where the Lord's cross was planted in the ground. Above the altar hangs a crucifix showing the crucified Lord with closed eyes. This crucifix is the main decoration of the altar, serving as a reminder to both the celebrant and the congregation that the sacrifice made on the altar is the same as the one made on the cross. The Crucifix in Christian Worship Therefore, it is important to always place the crucifix on the altar whenever Mass is celebrated, as directed in the Constitution Amos by Benedict XV on July 16, 1746. According to the instructions in the Roman Missal, the crucifix should be positioned at the center of the altar between the candlesticks, ensuring that it is large enough for both the celebrant and the congregation to easily see. If, for any reason, the crucifix is removed, another one may temporarily take its place at a lower position, but it must still be visible to all attendees of the Mass. It's interesting to note that while a crucifix is usually required on the altar during Mass, there are two exceptions to this rule. These exceptions occur when the crucifixion is depicted as the main feature of the altarpiece, or picture behind the altar. However, it's important to clarify that this exception only applies when the crucifixion is the primary focus, as opposed to depictions of saints holding a crucifix or kneeling before a cross. Furthermore, there's another special circumstance to consider. When the most blessed sacrament is displayed, whether in a church or another setting, there's a choice regarding the placement of the crucifix. In such cases, it's customary to place the standard crucifix on the altar. However, local traditions may dictate variations. If the crucifix remains on the altar, it shouldn't be censored. In the earlier days of Christianity, before the 4th century reign of Emperor Constantine, believers were cautious about openly showing the cross. They feared ridicule and persecution. However, everything changed after Constantine's conversion to Christianity. He not only stopped crucifixion as a form of execution, but also encouraged using the cross and the chai ro monogram as symbols of the Christian faith. As a result, these symbols became widely popular in Christian art and funerary monuments around 350 AD. In the centuries following Constantine's reign, Christians focused on the cross as a symbol of Christ's triumph over evil and death. They avoided detailed depictions of his suffering. The earliest crucifixes depicted Christ as alive, with eyes open and arms outstretched, emphasizing his divinity despite bearing wounds. However, as time progressed into the 9th century, artists started to focus more on depicting Christ's suffering and death in a more lifelike manner. This shift led to Western representations of the crucifixion becoming more detailed and emotive, showcasing heightened levels of pain and agony. Initially, in Romanesque crucifixes, Christ was often depicted wearing a regal crown, symbolizing his kingship. However, as artistic styles evolved into the Gothic period, the crown of thorns became the dominant symbol emphasizing Christ's sacrifice and suffering. Fast forward to the 20th century, and a new trend emerged in Roman Catholicism, particularly in the portrayal of liturgical crucifixes. Here, Christ is depicted as a crowned and vested king and priest, with less emphasis on the physical marks of his suffering. This shift in representation underscores a different aspect of Christ's identity, focusing more on his divine authority and role as a spiritual leader. Despite these changes in artistic interpretation, the crucifix remains a powerful symbol in Christianity, integral to practices such as exorcisms. Its enduring significance reflects the central role of Christ's sacrifice and redemption in the faith. Divine Signs and Symbols On a significant Wednesday, March 29th, something extraordinary unfolded within the revered Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, a place held sacred by Christians worldwide. Father Theodore Dodd, 
the custodian of this historic church, bore witness to an event that stirred the hearts of those present. In the early hours of that fateful day, Father Theodore noticed a remarkable occurrence. The eyes of the crucifix icon positioned above the altar, precisely where Jesus Christ is believed to have been crucified, began to emit a luminous glow. These eyes, which had been sealed shut for as long as anyone could remember, suddenly opened, captivating all who beheld them. Father Theodore, along with numerous priests and visitors, stood in awe as they witnessed this divine spectacle. The eyes remained open throughout the day, an inexplicable phenomenon that defied rational explanation. Moved by what he had experienced, Father Theodore took to social media on April 1st to share a gripping account of the miraculous event. His narrative captivated the hearts and minds of countless individuals, both within the church and beyond. This unexpected occurrence sparked fervent discussions among believers, igniting a renewed sense of faith and reverence for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It was a moment that reaffirmed the spiritual significance of this sacred place, leaving an indelible mark on all who were fortunate enough to witness it. He tells the story of his friend, Arander Malus Bas, who managed to capture a remarkable moment in vivid detail through photographs. Father Theodore, in his account, describes how the crucified Christ, typically depicted with closed eyes in icons, appeared with eyes wide open, defying the usual portrayal. This extraordinary sight left a lasting impression on all who witnessed it, leaving an indelible mark on their minds. Early the next day, on March 30th, Arkham Andrite Melakos shared these pictures on his Facebook page, expressing his awe by writing, Wondrous art thou, O Lord, in thy saints. The cross of Golgotha opened its eyes. This is the first time this has happened. The crucified Lord on Golgotha always has his eyes closed. But today, for some reason, he miraculously opened his eyes. Father Theodore added that since the original post, they have received a variety of comments and feedback. Some sources affirm the miracle, citing contacts in Jerusalem, while others claim it has been denied by the Holy See. However, regardless of the debate, the event underscores the countless miracles believed to have occurred in the Holy Land, the very place where the Lord lived, walked, died, and rose again for our salvation. They are open to the idea that God may continue to bless His Church through miracles. One such miraculous event recently occurred just a week after renovations were completed on the revered Edicule, sheltering the Lord's tomb. This remarkable occurrence was preceded by two weeks of the highly anticipated annual celebration of the Holy Fire within the sacred precincts of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on Holy Saturday. However, it's worth noting that doubt has surrounded such events in the past. For example, there have been reports of similar incidents, such as a viral video in August 2016 showing a statue of Jesus Christ in a Mexican church seemingly opening and closing its eyes. This video garnered international media attention and sparked widespread discussion on social media. Despite claims of authenticity by paranormal investigators, doubt prevailed, with many attributing the incident to optical illusions or video editing. Similarly, a comparable incident was reported in a small village in Nigeria. These occurrences prompt us to explore the possibility of divine intervention, but also remind us of the importance of critical thinking and doubt in evaluating such phenomena. On a memorable day in November 2016, the Catholic Church of St. Augustine stirred up quite a buzz around town. The reason? An extraordinary event took place that captured the attention of both believers and skeptics alike. It all started when a crucifix, depicting Christ after his resurrection, hanging prominently within the church, suddenly began to emit a brilliant light. Witnesses marveled as the figure of Christ seemed to shimmer with an otherworldly glow, similar to the sparkle of precious gemstones. News of this remarkable occurrence spread like wildfire, 
drawing crowds of curious onlookers from all walks of life. People, regardless of their religious affiliations, were drawn to the illuminated crucifix, reaching out in awe and offering prayers for divine intervention. Yet amidst the excitement, whispers of doubt emerged. Some questioned whether the event was truly a miraculous sign from above or simply a product of collective imagination, a case of mass hysteria. During these conflicting views, Father Theodore, the spiritual leader of the church, urged his flock to reflect on the deeper meaning of their faith. He reminded them that while miracles can indeed strengthen one's belief, true faith goes beyond spectacular displays of divine power. Instead, it is rooted in personal encounters with the divine, in communion with the living God, and in bearing witness to the foundational events of Christianity, the crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. In essence, Father Theodore encouraged his congregation to focus not solely on extraordinary occurrences, but on the enduring truths that form the bedrock of their faith. It is through these profound encounters and unwavering devotion that believers find strength and sustenance for their journey of faith. He reminds us of something truly amazing that often gets overlooked, the special change that happens during every divine worship. It's when the bread and wine become something incredibly sacred, the body and blood of Christ. This isn't just a small thing. It's a powerful reminder of God's presence among us. Theodore, in his reflections, sees this transformation as a sign from God, something that should strengthen our faith and remind us of the immense love shown through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. He encourages us to think about this, to repent for our wrongdoings, and to get ready for Holy Week and Easter, where we celebrate Christ's resurrection. He praises everything about this incredible event, which is filled with holiness and mystery. It's a testament to how strong faith can be and how divine and special the place where it happens truly is. What are your thoughts on the miracle in Jerusalem and the divine sign footage? Let us have your opinions in the comments below.